Something extraordinary happened today, something that has shaken the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, and the entire world of science and education. The president of Stanford, a university that consistently ranks in the top three in the world, resigned. Mark Tessier Levine, who has led Stanford for seven years, sent out a letter announcing his departure at the end of next month. It comes after months of explosive reporting by an 18-year-old student journalist who spent his freshman year digging into accusations that the president of his university supervised falsified research and allowed it to be published. Joining us live now, Stanford sophomore-to-be and investigations editor of the student newspaper, The Stanford Daily, Theo Baker. Theo, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm sure it's a really busy day for you today because Tessier Levine's resignation really caps a stunning set of events that you put into motion last November when you wrote the first article about potential missteps in the work done by his lab before he came to Stanford. What were those allegations? Yeah, so um, it's important to note that, uh, you know, there were whisperings of, of something regarding alleged uh, or manipulated research that uh, Tessier Levine had published that were floating around the internet for years. They were hiding in scientific forums, they were hiding on blog posts, but they'd never been reported, even while Stanford, uh, uh, he assumed the post of Stanford's president, uh, where he directs an institution with more than $8.9 billion in yearly funding, higher than 11 U.S. states. So these allegations revolved around the idea that uh, images that were published in his papers had been manipulated and photoshopped to show results that they did not actually represent. All right. And in that first November article, I think you published that image, which also you guys looked at, uh, had forensic scientists work with you on that. So we're going to go ahead and pull that up. Um, I think this is too much for the layman and myself to understand. <laughs> uh, but bottom line, I think what you were able to glean from talking to lots of scientists is that uh, this data was not correct when it was submitted to publications, right? And that uh, somebody at the top of the lab whose name is on the lab should have noticed. Is that what they said? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine from a story that has been progressing over the months, there are a lot of different allegations that have at this point uh, come out of the woodwork. Um, the original story focused on uh, a number of different errors, like the one that you can see on your screen here. That is what uh, forensic image analysts call a type one duplication, where the same blot is literally just replicated and put in another uh, space. Some of the manipulations are a lot more tricky to spot. Um, little bits and pieces are spliced together to make it look that, like there are different results. All told, there are about a dozen papers on which Tessie Levine is a co-author, a named co-author, that seem to have manipulated imagery. For five of those, he's the principal author, uh, and he's now agreed as a result of this report that also led to him stepping down to uh, retract, or, retract or issue lengthy corrections to all of these very widely cited papers. Uh, and, and that's something that definitely wouldn't have happened uh, had uh, our reporting not brought this into the fore and Stanford decided to uh, investigate itself. I want to ask you what Stanford's reaction was initially, because you published dozens of articles on this subject, <laughs> and um, it sounds like that there was some prodding before they put together this uh, board to kind of lead the investigation and then eventually hire an outside firm. All those things were not a given from the start, right? Yeah, nothing about this was given. Uh, you know, certainly I <laughs> might not have expected it to play out the way that it did. Um, one thing that we still remain shocked at is that the university did open an investigation within a day, uh, which was rather remarkable. Uh, that's not something Stanford has a, a real history of doing. Um, and, you know, that investigation obviously was sort of fraught with its own issues. We revealed that one of the people they appointed to investigate him had an $18 million investment in his company. Uh, and so they hired a lawyer to do the review instead. Uh, you know, our recent reporting suggests that they might not have had access to certain sources because they would not guarantee them anonymity despite non-disclosure agreements. Um, so that in and of itself has been a big part of the story, Stanford's reaction to this uh, and how, you know, they have decided to dig into the research of, you know, the top person at one of America's most premier research institutions. So finally, that outside law firm, they released their findings two days ago. And what was the ultimate conclusion? 
Yeah, so uh, the report just came out publicly this morning, and it was somewhat remarkable for us to read. It concluded that Tessier Levine had inculcated a culture across two decades and three different institutions where he rewarded the winners and he punished the losers, and that resulted in a number of manipulated uh, research data to be published in his name. Now, the report did not conclude that he directly manipulated things, but it did conclude that for two decades, he uh, failed to correct the scientific record despite being ma made aware of allegations a number of different times. And that was really remarkable to read, especially uh, in, a, in a report that was sanctioned and uh, sponsored by Stanford's own uh, board of trustees. Can I just ask you to dive in a little more deeply into that conclusion? of uh, rewarding the winners, those who produce mm -hmm. positive results, if you will, and uh, marginalizing the losers, meaning those postdocs who maybe didn't. Do you think that culture is bigger than one man? Oh, without a doubt. And that's actually, I mean, I, I think if we're talking about this story as something that can uh, be taken to you know, mean things that are greater than any one individual man, I really hope that this is a big part of that conversation scientific integrity, who takes responsibility for errors, who you know is pushing people or uh, uh, not necessarily providing the safeguards to prevent things like this happening. Um, there are a lot of senior researchers in science who put their names on papers they didn't write, they didn't research, and they really didn't have all that much to do with. And you know they take credit for it when it is convenient for them. And if errors arise, sometimes they try to disclaim those. Uh, and so I, I hope that this can open up a much broader conversation about who takes responsibility uh, when things like this happen in science. Unfortunately, we've seen a few instances of that this summer, Francesca Gino over at, at uh, Harvard and obviously the Dan Ariely stuff also coming out at a similar time. So the idea that research uh, integrity is being taken more seriously now and, and hopefully that our reporting has contributed to that. I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. and, and we want to be fair, Tessier Levine's letter, we want to show part of it today that he sent to the Stanford community. He says, the panel did not find that I engaged in research misconduct regarding the 12 papers reviewed, nor did it find I had knowledge of or was reckless regarding research misconduct in my lab. The panel's report identifies some areas where I should have done better, and I re accept the report's conclusions, uh, again, mirroring that maybe closer supervision would have been warranted. But I want to ask you, during all this time, I'm sure you went to Tessier Levine multiple times, did he ever talk to you? No, never. Uh, and it, that has been, you know, consistently something that has uh, uh, been a frustration for me because obviously I, m my primary concern for all of this has been trying to put together the most complete portrait that I can. And when his side of the story is one that he chooses not to tell us or he chooses not to answer questions about, um, you know, it makes it even harder to uh, understand or report his perspective. Um, Tessie Levine has dodged a number of questions. And it is fair to say that his narrative throughout uh, the last series of months has changed dramatically. At first, his very initial defense that he reiterated multiple times said that the alleged manipulation in his papers uh, had no bearing on the findings of the studies. Um, obviously, since now several of them are being retracted, that is not true. Um, he also had claimed a, a number of things that have since been uh, somewhat walked back. Uh, for example, he said that the data were reproducible about one of the, these uh, papers that's in question. Um, and actually, Genentech, the company where he worked, confirmed that he knew even before it was published that the data were not reproducible. And even the Stanford report, he had said publicly about that same paper that it is totally inappropriate to retract or correct it. And the report that Stanford issued says, no, it should be retracted or corrected with a lengthy retract, uh, correction. You said these rumors have been swirling about scientific forums for many years. Was this something Stanford had known about during the time of their hiring process to find the next president before he was hired? I mean, did they hire him knowing this was out there and Stanford being a leading scientific institution and research university? Yeah, I mean, my understanding of this boils down to the fact that this is not the sort of thing that a vetting committee is sort of normally looking at. You know, as far as we know, Tessie Levine has never killed anyone or sexually assaulted someone or evaded taxes, uh, which are sort of the things that you're most obviously looking for when you're vetting someone for an executive position. Research misconduct is something that is often shrouded in mystery. It is a, a conversation that really needs to be brought to the fore more because there's a lot that I think uh, people who are in my position a year ago uh, not necessarily have context to understand. And uh, my understanding is that uh, a number of, I, I do not believe that a number of these issues had been raised with Stanford at the time that he was selected. 
uh, despite the fact that several of them uh, had been raised publicly in places that if you knew where to look, you could find. I wonder what kind of reactions, messages you might be getting from your Stanford friends or professors or the rest of the Stanford community today. Yeah, look, I, I'm exceedingly lucky. The only reason I'm able to do this is because I've had people who are willing to stand behind me. I've had a fantastic team at the Stanford Daily. That's our independent student newspaper celebrating its 50th anniversary of independence this year. And I've also been so lucky that a, a community of professional journalists have stood behind us and supported us. Um, we were the first student organization ever to be given a Polk Award, um, and that absolutely blew all of our minds, I think. Um, the idea that people have been willing to go out on a limb and stand behind us when we are in a really vulnerable vulnerable position doing this reporting, you know, we're reporting on a guy who ultimately has control over all of us. Um, so the fact that we've had people standing by us the whole time, who are now also, uh, you know, recognizing that a lot of our reporting uh, has been, you know, verified uh, by Stanford's own committee, it, it really means the world to to me and to our entire team. You mentioned the Journalism Award, the Polk Award. I just want folks to know, our viewers may not know this if they're not in the business. That is a very prestigious award and at 18 you are the youngest ever to get that honor mm -hmm. and you know i don't know if this is all sunken in or what your plans are for the future but um are you going to journalism god i don't know i think i have to pick a major first um stanford doesn't you don't even have, have a major, a journalism major. <laughs> no i don't it's uh i've been i guess a little distracted um but you know, it, it has been, you know, uh, a sort of quite a strange year. Um, a, a year ago, I had not stepped foot in a Stanford classroom ever. Um, you know, I had yet to pick my first classes, yet to learn where I was going to live in a dorm, uh, certainly had yet to uh, come across a number of the uh, scientific things that I would end up investigating. Um, so to be in this position a year later is um, utterly strange. Um, and. You know, for the most part, I think it's it's a good thing. I feel really um, pleased that we are able to contribute to the scientific record being able to correct itself uh, in these five very, uh, you know, widely read and influential papers. Um, I, I do feel confident in saying that those papers would not have been retracted or corrected without our reporting. So to be able to contribute to the scientific record, especially as someone like me, who is not a neuroscientist like Martessier Levine and does not often have opportunities to contribute to uh, science as a whole, it really means a lot. All right, well, Theo Baker, we can't wait to see what you'll report on next. Uh, Theo D Baker, editor of investigations at the Stanford Daily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Take care.